so quiet out here. Are you guys all right? <laughs> it's raining. All right. You know, we are coming out of, hopefully, a crazy year, and we're stepping into a new, we're at the end of this year, and I thought since we're out of our series, our verse by verse through second and third John, I might just step out and share a message about, well, not losing heart, about continuing on. Some practical, I, I think, some sound, balanced truth about living as a Christian in a fallen world, in a world that's not perfect. I mean, we, we uh, my wife and I just traveled a little bit this week. We were in California for two days and then in Nevada for about six days visiting our daughter. And while we were in California, the the code changed there for the pandemic. It went from one color to another color, sort of escalated, and so things got tightened down. You know, we kind of live in an area where it's been uh, not so difficult, but California is a whole different story. I mean, you walk without a mask down the street, you get stopped. Uh, there's people looking through your windows. No, not really. They're not looking through your window. You kind of feel that way, though. It's very, very intense. And so we're co coming out of this, hopefully, this crazy time where we've got this pandemic globally. We've got this really a global movement for racial justice that's impacted the world in a whole different way. We've seen in our own country this year sort of... Um, just a move to remove objects, statues, and monuments that have been part of our history for, well, for as long as I can remember. We've watched this George Floyd issue uh, ebb and flow. It's been on the television a million times. We, we, I think, if you're awake and aware and listening, and you've been around for a while, you've seen the moral decay of America began to change and continue to grow darker. And this economic situation we're in, a lot of small businesses have shut down. Uh, there have been 400 hurricanes in the Gulf this summer. I mean, it's crazy what's going on. Fires in Australia, if you can remember that far back. The potential fraud that's being talked about with the election and all that's going on with that and, and the mistrust of mainline media and now even the mistrust of social media, which seems to be a big issue. Now, if, if you take all that and roll it together with just the normal trials of life, health and, you know, children and temptation and all the different things that we're going through. Let me read a verse for you and then take some time to describe what the Apostle Paul is talking about from 2 Corinthians. If you have a Bible, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, where Paul says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Let's pray together. Lord, as we open your word, we ask again that you would open our hearts. And Lord, help us to receive what you have to say. Let our hearts be soft and let there be good soil there where a seed can be planted and produce much fruit. Awaken us to hear what you would have to say to us today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We do not lose heart, the Apostle Paul says. In fact, in Galatians chapter 6, 9, and 10, he, he says this in a different way. He says, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let's do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. 
I think in the time and day that we live in, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to take these inspired words and sort of speak them into our hearts about not growing weary, not losing heart, not giving up. And there, there is kind of this sense sometimes you feel it that people are like, well, why bother? Who cares? And, uh, you know, the world's crazy. It's dangerous. It's overwhelming. It's scary. And Paul begins in this passage to share with us how not to lose heart, even though we're living in difficult times, with limitations and circumstances sometimes out of our control. He, he says there, do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, the inward man's being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, verse 17, which is but for a moment, well, it's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We don't look to the things which are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul talks about several different topics here. He talks about the outer self and the inner self. You, you have an outer self, this body that everyone sees, it functions, it gets impacted by all kinds of sights, sounds, and sensory things, and you have an inner self, which can be renewed, Paul says, day by day. All the difficulties and the pressures in life that impact our outer self, and yet there's this inner self that can grow and be strong and continually change. There's the present affliction, and then there's the eternal glory. And Paul is using these in context, please listen, let me have your attention, with not losing heart. All these things that, inf that, that affect you, this present affliction, you know, relationships, decisions, sickness, all the stuff that happens. And then there's this reminder about eternal glory, which is coming, which is beyond compare, beyond our understanding. And then number three, not only does he talk about outer self, inner self, present affliction, eternal glory, he talks about the seen and the unseen. We all see from our perspective the different things that are going on, the instability of the world, the radical mindsets and the fragile peace and the, the trying to balance the power around the globe and what's happening in our own country, the financial stability. And, and Paul reminds us, okay, there's things you see, but there's also some things you don't see, that aren't temporal, that aren't unstable, that are unseen. See, here's the exhortation, and I want you to stay with me. Here's what Paul is saying by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to you and I. When trials come, and they do, when difficult times are here, and I think they are, when conflict occurs, with the outer self, when you're discouraged by what you see and hear and read, remember there's a renewing of the inner man, the inner person. There is an eternal glory that will be so amazing and beyond your expectation. Fix your eyes on the eternal, the unseen. But you say, well, John, that's great, but what are they? These unseen things. I mean, I'm supposed to look at them. How do I see them? This glory and how does it help me face the rest of the year, my stepping into 2021? And how does my inner life get renewed day by day? Paul begins to answer those questions as he steps into chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. J just listen. He says, for we know that if our earthly house, this body, this tent, he calls it, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, it's eternal in the heavens. For in this, this tent, we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven, 
If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up. And I love this verse, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we're always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body, but to be home with the Lord. Paul says our earthly home, this body, is likened, well, he calls it a tent. He doesn't call it a palace. He doesn't call it an estate. He doesn't call it a penthouse. He doesn't call it our forever home. He says, you and I live in a tent. Are you familiar with a tent? It has stakes in the ground. It's made out of canvas. And ropes hold it in place. And it's a temporary structure. Never intended to be lived in forever. It wears out. It gets old. It decays. It breaks down. Just like your body. Your body breaks down chemically, physically, psychologically. It just does. If you're living in a body, and I assume you are, (laughs) it ages and it breaks down. That's why they make movies like this. Because that's the kind of body you'd really like. (laughs) That's insane. Iron Man. If you could be Iron Man, but you're not. You live in a tent. You live in this thing that's not immune to circumstances that can be overwhelmed and overloaded and and you have a heart and a mind and, and all these things that, well, Paul says it's like a tent. It can get sick. He said, John, this is so depressing after the Christmas messages and the songs and stuff. I know, but I want you to listen. And please don't misunderstand. As a believer, Paul is reminding us, and I think this is so important for believers to know, That as Christians, although we're saved and we've been given all kinds of benefits through Christ and he's given us all kinds of resources, here on earth, you and I still live in a tent. And that's what he says. In fact, he says there in in chapter 5, verse 4, for we who are in this tent groan being burdened. We who are in this tent groan and we have burdens. Now, now, maybe you're a camper. I don't know. Maybe there's some campers out there. And man, you love to get the tent, go out in the woods, get by a lake, you know, hammer it in the stakes, get the tent up, put the poles in, have a little fire, catch some trout, make some s'mores. You would never stay in some sissy RV. <laughs> you, you would never stay in some fancy hotel. Man, I'm a, I, I'm a camper, but you don't stay in that tent forever, do you? Oh, no, you ready to break ground and go home, get in that soft bed? If you stayed in that tent year-round, you'd be groaning. That's what he says here. If you're in a tent, you groan. You're burdened. Difficulties, problems in life. No matter how spiritual you are, how godly you are, how much you pray, how much of the Bible you know, how close to the Lord you are, the bottom line, the practical reality of Christianity is still this. You and I live in a tent and we groan and we put up with burdens. One amen out of this whole (laughs) bunch of people. (laughs) I'll second that. 
Now, the Apostle Paul is an amazing example of what it means to know Christ, to live for Christ. He, he wrote most of the New Testament. And if he groaned, I'm sure we groan. Look at verse 1, chapter 5. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God. He says this tent will be destroyed. Your tent, my tent, will one day be taken down. And it's just a fact of life. I mean, I've had the uncomfortable position of doing my brother's funeral, my sister's funeral, my stepsister's funeral, my stepfather's funeral, and I could go on and on and on. Where God decided one day to come and say, it's time to take this tent down. And he pulls up the stakes, he folds up the tent, and one day we're all evicted from the tent. You say, well, John, wait a minute. It says right there, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed. What about the big if? Well, Paul always lived with the tension and the possibility, and we do too, that the rapture could come, that Christ could take us home. So he says, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul is giving us a realistic understanding of the life of following Jesus in a tent. And he's saying to you, he's saying to me, he's saying to us, don't lose heart. God has this. He knows you live in a tent. He knows you have burdens. He knows you groan. And he's, he knows there's trials and temptations that, that are real for all of us. In fact, Jesus said it like this in Mark chapter 8. When, he, when he's talking to his disciples, he called the people and his disciples. And he said, whosoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That was his directive. Jesus didn't say, follow me. And I'll give you the American dream. Follow me and you'll have no worries or hassles. See, Paul wants us to not lose heart. And one way you don't lose heart is to have a realistic understanding and expectation of the believer's life. There are difficulties. There is taking up a cross. There is at times denying myself. We live in a tent, Paul says, and there is groaning but there's an eternal perspective to it that he brings in that they have a building from God a house made not with hands eternal in the heavens see you as a Christian if you're a believer here today you own two homes one here that's canvas and ropes and stakes in the ground but also one in heaven that's eternal that's enduring that's permanent that's stable, that God himself is building. Jesus says, hey, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And one day, the moving truck will pull up and it'll be time to move. And you'll go to a new home. To be absent from the body, it says there in verse eight, is to be at home with the Lord. And the contrast is radical. One is, one is temporary and, 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 it's, and it's filled with burdens and groaning and, and it's trials, it'll be destroyed, but the building in heaven is permanent, it's eternal, it's glorious, and it says in verse 4 of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians that one day you and I will be swallowed up in life. What an amazing description. Eternal life, a quality of life, a permanency of life, a, an ongoing life, and, and, it's, and you'll be there with him forever and ever and ever. Listen, this is not your forever home. I, I hear that my wife does a little bit of real estate, and we hear people say, oh, I'm looking for my forever home. And I think to myself, not here, you're not. <laughs> I mean, Lynn and I have moved so many times. We, we, we got married. Nine months later, we moved to Kansas City where she finished college and I went to seminary. We lived in a little tiny uh, student housing. It was small. 
We moved here and moved to an expansive, giant, thousand-foot duplex. Then we built our first house in Tiger Point. Then we built a house in Paradise Bay. Then we built another one in Tiger Point. Then we built one down in Holly by the Sea. And we kept moving and moving and moving. And let me say something about moving. It's a bummer. It's never easy. Especially if you're building a house. Because you and your wife are in such perfect harmony when you're building that house. <laughs> with, <laughs> with paint colors and fixtures. I mean, it's just the smoothest thing you'll ever do in life. And you have to prepare it. You have to come up with the ideas, the building costs, all of that. But, but look what it says about our, our permanent home in verse 5. Now, he who has prepared for us this very thing is God. God's building it. God's preparing it. I don't have to look at plans. I don't have to get a loan. I don't have to worry about the soil test or the WDO or all the other different things. God prepares for us our heavenly home. That indeed is your forever home. And there's no light bill. You don't have to worry about solar energy. And it tells us here that, that now he who has prepared us, look at verse 5, for this very thing is God, and he also given us the spirit, verse 5, as a guarantee. What? That God says, look, I'm going to build you a home in heaven. And I'm going to send my Holy Spirit as a guarantee that your home is yours. And he starts it like this. First of all, he comes by his spirit and he begins to knock on the door of your heart. You may not even be a Christian. And he begins to say, hey, I want to prepare a home for you. You want to what? Yeah, first I just want to know you. And he begins to draw you and call you and convict you and, and, and begin to expose you to his word and to Christians. And you don't really even know what's going on at that time. I didn't. It's like, well, what's going on? I'm starting to listen to this music and I'm reading stuff. And pretty soon you come to the place where the knocking gets persistent and you open the door of your heart and Jesus comes in by his spirit and begins to live in your life. And from that moment on, to the day you're evicted from this tent with its groaning and its burdens. From that day to that day, you'll come to a place where one day when you step out of this tent, you'll be completely, it says in the scripture here, swallowed up by life. Not by darkness, not by death, but swallowed up by life. I love, I love verse 1 of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. It says, for we know. You know, we kind of think it's going to happen. We're, we're hoping. We wish. No, the apostle says, we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It's sure. He says, that's why we don't lose heart. Right, right now, it's It's tough. There's COVID, there's groaning, there's the bridges out. But, you know, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it tells us in verse 6, we're always confident, knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. But then verse 8, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Two homes, listen, two homes. You have one life, but you have two homes. One is here, and hopefully one is in heaven if you're a believer. In verse 7, it says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So we're trusting right now. We're believing right now. Can't see it. It's unseen. Two parts, a life in this tent, and then one day a life in heaven. One life Two parts, each of them, your life here on this earth and your life in your heavenly home are filled with opportunities and challenges, both of them. Right now, living in this tent, boy, there's all kinds of challenges. I don't have to describe them for you. It's pretty easy to see them. The challenges, the difficulties, the circumstances. You live in a tent. You walk by faith, not by sight. But one day when we see Christ and we're with the Lord, we'll see all his glory and faith 
will be turned to sight. You'll see it. Now we know all the challenges of living here by faith, the temptations, the flesh, the world, the enemy. But there are also challenges, believe it or not, when you get to heaven. There's opportunities and challenges here, and there's opportunities and challenges when we're home with the Lord. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As we continue to read, as Paul is discussing, how do we not lose heart? In verse 9, therefore, we make it our aim, whether present here in the tent or absent at home with the Lord, to be well-pleasing to him. For, verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or or bad. And the bad could be actually the word worthless. So here's the challenge. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not a, a, a seat of, of where you're going to be sent to hell or to heaven. This is to be judged for what we did to give an account for what we did as believers here on earth. And I want to say a couple of things about this. All Christians will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and it's not about your salvation. It's not a place where you'll be condemned either. Romans 8 verse 1 says very clearly that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It's not a place where you're condemned, this judgment seat of Christ. In fact, in John, it says, you know, God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. In Romans 10, 11, it says, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So let me have your attention. Every believer who leaves the tent and goes to his eternal home will eventually stand before the judgment seat of Christ, not to be condemned, not to be shamed but to give an account. See, here's the thing. You and I will, according to Scripture, give an account for our lives. Hebrews 4.13 says, And there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give account, our compassionate high priest. We'll give an account to the Lord for how we lived our life when we became believers. Romans 14, 12. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Matthew 12, 36. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it on the day of judgment. Now, let me have your attention. Not to shame us, not to in some way condemn us, but God will have us give an account of our life. You say, well, okay, but I still go to heaven. Well, yeah. It's not about heaven or hell. It's it's about the life you lived as a believer. See, when I was in college, Bible college, I had to take all these courses. I was a missions major and a Bible major, but they also had this elective that you had to take every year called a student ministry. There was no grade given for it. And so a lot of guys just goofed off. I say, hey, what's your student ministry? Well, I signed up for such and such, but I don't really do it. What do you mean you don't really do it? Well, it doesn't count towards your grade. Well, how do you get out of it? Well, I just signed myself in, but I never go. Really? Well, I, I, I... Didn't know what student ministry to take, so I I went to the guy who was over student ministries, who actually became a friend of mine, this professor, and I said, he said, well, what are you majoring in? I said, well, missions and Bible. He says, well, so are you going to find yourself speaking and preaching? I go, yeah, that's that's the end goal, I think. He goes, well, you should sign up for our student ministry where you actually do that. So I've never done it before. He goes, well, good, you'll learn. So what should I sign up for? He goes, jail ministry. I go, jail ministry? He goes, yeah, you have to preach almost every Sunday night at the jail. I said, wow. 
So the first sermon I ever gave, there, the group of guys would, and girls, the girls went to the women's jail, the guys went to the men's in Bartow County there, down near Lakeland, and we would break up into groups, somebody would be singing songs, and they'd leave one guy with about eight cells, and you'd walk back and forth and preach. I'll never forget my first sermon preaching there in a jail. I thought, well, at least they're not going anywhere. They've got to listen. <laughs> and they would, some of them would be flushing their toilets while I was, you know, just, just sitting there looking at you. Others would be, hurry up! They'd be smoking. Every once in a while, you'd give an altar call, and a guy would stick his hand out, and you'd get to go pray with him. In fact, that's where I, I met Lynn for the first time. She was incarcerated in the jail. <laughs> Oh, she was doing the women's ministry, and I saw her for the first time on the bus. But here's what I found out about the student ministry. Even though I didn't get a grade for it, there was no A, B, C, or, or any kind of, you know, credit that went with it, I learned so much about myself and fear and standing before people and, and speaking when there was inter interruptions and, and I met Lynn and, you know, all the different things that came with it. it, did, it did it matter to my grade? No. Does it get me into heaven? No. But boy, some of the things it did in my life. And we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not, not to see if we get into heaven or not, but to see what we did with what God gave us to do, even though it has nothing to do with entrance into heaven. So, so there's this, this challenge in heaven. There's this challenge here on earth. There, there's this, uh, you know, judgment seat, not to be condemned, but to give an account and there's also, I believe, the fact that you might be rewarded in heaven. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 4, we have, it says that your charitable deed, remember this when Jesus talked about giving and praying, that, that your father who sees in secret himself will reward you openly. And then he talks about in verse 6 of that same chapter, but when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret, and your father who is in secret will reward you openly. Rewards are talked about all through the scripture. In verse 18 of that same chapter, it says, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but you know, you, it's, in other words, you don't walk around, oh, I'm fasting. Well, you got your reward. But let the Father reward you. In Matthew 25, it talks about laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Well done, good and faithful servant. Faithful of a few things, I'll make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Then the next verse in Matthew 25. I think we have two of them there. 23. Yeah. 21. Matthew chapter 6. Bingo. Let's go on to Matthew. There we go. Do not lay up for your treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where the thieves do not break in and steal. Lay up treasures in heaven. There, there's reward. And I think the Apostle Paul, as he's talking about this standing before the judgment seat of Christ, is reflecting back on a passage of Scripture I want to read to you that he had just sent to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Listen to what he says. And we're getting close to the end here. He says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work, mine, yours, will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, He'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Paul told them that in an earlier message there in 1 Corinthians, and now in 2 Corinthians, he tells them again about standing accountably before the Lord. See, right now, listen, you and I, 
have the privilege, the opportunity, the challenge of pleasing the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, before he mentions the judgment seat of Christ, he says, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, this or the next, to be well-pleasing to him. Before you leave this house, you have the opportunity and I have the opportunity, you have the challenge and I have the challenge to please the Lord. So how do you do that? Well, one simple way is just by prayer. Praying for others. Praying that his will might be done in your own life. Seeking the Lord. You know, the Lord has asked us to pray. Pray for for the gap to be filled. Pray for those who are lost. And, And when you get to heaven, you know what? There's no more prayer. It's face to face. No one's going to ask you when you get to heaven, hey, we're having a Monday morning 6.30 prayer meeting. Would you like to come? No, it's not going to happen. This is your opportunity to be well-pleasing to him. Right now, as you live in this body, in this tent, full of its groanings and its difficulties and its challenges, this is the opportunity that you have to be pleasing to him by being courageous for him. You stand up and identify yourself of who you are, you know, where you work in your neighborhood and, and to do something in your classroom, wherever it might be, to identify yourself courageously with Christ. Because you know what? In heaven, everybody's a Christian. You know, hey, I'm a believer. Well, oh, duh, you're in heaven. We didn't expect to see you here, but Okay. This is the only chance you have in this life here on earth to resist temptation. When the Bible says over and ago, resist the enemy and he'll flee from you. Resist this temptation. When you get to heaven, there's no temptation. This is the time where you stand for him and resist temptation. Where you say no to the lust of the eye and the flesh and all those things. This is it. You can be well-pleasing to him because here's the deal. All of us are going to stand before that judgment seat. This is the time to trust him, to walk by faith, to obey, to be involved in serving, not just everything by sight. This is the time to be a witness, to share your faith, to invite people to church, to tell them about Jesus. There's no lost people in heaven. This is it. This is the opportunity where he says, hey, be my witnesses. Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world. I've called you to do that. Go into all the world, make disciples, and I'll be with you. And you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And there's this opportunity here and this challenge here. There's an opportunity there and a challenge there to be pleasing to him. This is your opportunity now to be compassionate to people. To those who are sick and suffering and people who are in need. There's no people in need suffering and poor in heaven. This is our chance to be the body of Christ, to to be an individual who who sees someone with a need that you can meet. It's not going to happen up there. There's no homeless people. There's no sick people. There's no tears. And this is your opportunity and my opportunity to be a giver, sacrificially. To give to the things of the kingdom and to sacrifice because up there we rest from our labors, not down here. This is not the time where we're looking for our forever home in the most comfortable, relaxed place we can possibly find. Now that, that's, that, right now we live in a tent. And, and if, you're, if you're anywhere near my age, you know it's a tent. It's getting thin on top. The, the, the nerves are frayed. Stakes are coming up. We have an eternal home, though. Let let me read a passage of Scripture to you. It goes like this. For for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I'll never forget as a young guy, about 17, I 
I used to surf a lot, and I'm walking down the road by the cross down the beach, have my board, I'm coming out of the water. And it was about that time that the Lord was tugging on me. My older brother had become a Christian and some of my friends, and he was knocking pretty heavily on my door, and I was listening to Christian music. I was reading the Gospel of John a little bit, and I was all convicted about my lifestyle, and I'm walking down the road looking for my car to put the board on it, and I see this Christian's car. It had bumper stickers all over it, but one bumper sticker just jumped out at me, and I read it, and I thought, wow, what does that mean? It said this, one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. And I thought, is that true? Is that real? We, we have this earthly house, this tent. And, and we groan in it, he says, earnestly desiring to be clothed from heaven. We're in this tent, being burdened. Not because we want to be unclothed, and, but he has prepared for us this very thing is God. And he's given us his spirit as a guarantee. So we're always confident knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord because we're walking by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well, pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Listen. Don't lose heart. Don't give up. Don't grow weary and well-doing. Make it your aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things he has done, whether good or worthless. We have this opportunity right now in life, regardless of your age or situation or circumstance or what your tent is like, God is preparing for you an eternal home that's beyond your dreams. It's your forever home. And one day, he says, your earthly house will be taken down and you'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So don't grow weary. Don't give up. Don't take your eyes and put them just on the temporal, just on the things that don't last and think that's all there is about life. Don't live in a way that when you stand before him, he says, so what did you do? Like, uh, not so much. But you'll be well pleasing to him. We live on this earth, in a tent, but we have two homes. We have two places. We have two calls upon our life. And Paul is reminding us in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of problems, in the midst of all that's swelling around him, and there was a lot, that we are called to not lose heart. For we walk by faith, not by sight, but we are confident, well pleased rather, that one day to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. Amen. Let's stand together.